My name is Kathleen Carter. I'm a vascular sonographer and I live and work in Norfolk, Virginia, affiliated with Eastern Virginia Medical School. And I'm going to talk to you today about technical protocols and tips for renal artery duplex ultrasound. We're going to talk today about renal artery disease and the protocol for doing a renovascular duplex ultrasound and hopefully give you a few tips to help you um, in that endeavor. Uh, color duplex ultrasound allows for both anatomic and functional assessment of the flow within the renal arteries. It does require a bit of skill. It's a little bit more challenging than some of the other peripheral vascular studies, but in centers that perform many studies, the sensitivity and specificity can be very high. We're going to use peak uh, systolic velocity, renal index, resistive index, systolic rise time, and the renal aortic ratio uh, to look at uh, potential stenoses within the renal arteries. The indications for doing a renovascular duplex would be new onset hypertension and particularly hypertension that's refractory to medical management. Many of these patients come in and they are on three or four medications without control of their blood pressure. We also can use this for monitoring of known renal artery stenosis. Um, we're often referred patients who have a uh, bump up in BUN and creatinine or with an epigastric or flank brewery. Um, we are occasionally asked to look at patients uh, with the potential renal vein occlusion or in follow-up to a procedure like renal artery bypass, um, angioplasty, stenting, uh, sometimes for screening for renal artery stenosis prior to beginning ACE inhibitor therapy, suspected renal artery aneurysms, suspected AV fistula, particularly after a biopsy, or evaluation of renal transplants. Now, atherosclerosis causes about 90% of renovascular hypertension. Most hypertension is essential hypertension. A small portion of hypertensive patients have renovascular hypertension. And again, most of those are uh, caused by atherosclerosis. Stenosis usually occurs at the origin or orifice of the renal artery um, if it's atherosclerotic, and it's uh, almost half the time it's bilateral. There are no specific risk factors other than the normal cardiovascular risk factors. That is, there are no specific risk factors for renovascular um, plaque to develop that isn't associated with other plaque in other parts of the body. Plaque progression will occur about half of the time uh, within one year, but it is the most common correctable form of hypertension, so it's important that we identify it. There are no known contraindications uh, to this exam. However, there are some limitations or challenges. If the patient has had recent abdominal surgery incisions and it is tender, it may be hard to push on the abdomen. Um, bowel gas can be a problem, but it is something that is present with any ultrasound study in the abdomen and you just need to work around it and look at other um, views to work around any bowel gas that may be in your way. Patient obesity can be a challenge, or if the patient is uncooperative, can't be positioned properly, that may make the study more of a challenge. Some of the limitations associated with this ultrasound test are the fact that there are about 25% of the time accessory renal arteries and they may not come off anywhere near the main renal artery, so we have to really be vigilant in going after and looking for those. Um, there may be branch vessel disease that you might not identify. We're not very good at identifying uh, less than 60% stenoses, and Doppler angles and tortuosity of the renal artery can make a challenge uh, in getting the, the appropriate under 60 degree angle uh, spectral waveforms. The equipment that you need to use is going to be high resolution ultrasound that has um, good spectral and color Doppler deep within the um, abdomen. We're going to use low frequency transducers and I usually use a combination of transducers in performing renovascular duplex depending on the patient's body habitus and where you have to go. You often may have to use a phased array transducer with a small footprint to get between the ribs. It often takes more than one transducer to adequately assess the renal arteries and another tip might be that the optimum transducer position to image the kidney is not usually the best to access the entire renal artery. So you'll, you're, if you're used to doing kidney ultrasound, you're going to need to use different views to lay out the entire renal artery for assessment. 
patient preparation is usually keeping them NPO, but I usually let them have as much water as they want. That keeps the kidneys hydrated and it makes for better imaging. Um, absolutely, you want them to take their antihypertensive medications before coming in for their exam. And there is some consideration made for diabetics if they need to have a light breakfast that usually won't interfere with your test too badly. Um, have a light supper the evening before. I usually encourage patients not to eat anything that they know is gas producing. Scanning in the morning usually is best. No gum chewing or cigarette smoking because that introduces air into the abdomen. Usually position them with their head elevated in a comfortable position and um, most importantly, uh, allow enough time to do this exam properly. The exam compon components um, are going to include assessment of the aorta from diaphragm to the iliac bifurcation. We want to be able to identify if there's any aortic or atherosclerotic disease there because we're going to use the aorta uh, for a renal to aortic ratio. And you do not want to use the aorta if it's severely diseased, aneurysmal, um, or if the flow there is less than 40 centimeters per second or more than 100 centimeters per second. We're going to use direct visualization of the entire renal artery. We want to go, even though most of the disease is in the proximal portion, we want to look at the entire renal artery. Other diseases like fibromuscular dysplasia will be in the distal, uh, mid to distal portion of the renal artery. We're going to use B-mode, spectral and color Doppler. Um, all of the tools within the arsenal that our equipment can give us to identify where the blood flow is. And then there is um, indirect analysis that can be done, um, shouldn't be done independent of the main renal artery assessment, but can be some adjunctive pieces of uh, diagnostic information used in the parenchyma for acceleration time and systolic rise time and resistive index, and we'll talk about those separately. Um, there are a number of views and transducers that can be used. Um, AP view usually is where I start. The intercostal view can be used when you don't have good uh, AP um, imaging. My favorite view would be the subcostal view. The image here on the screen is of the banana peel view, as some folks call it. And um, this is not a view that I have particular success with, but many people do, where you can see both renal arteries in the longitudinal view coming off of the aorta. Um, you can put patients into the lateral decubitus and move their abdomen out of the way if you need to define um, certain portions that are not readily available in the AP view. Sometimes you can actually come in posteriorly. Using the liver and the spleen as a window is helpful um, any time that you go through something that's um, a tissue that is um, homogeneous that can help um, just provide a window into the kidney. Um, as I said before, it's probably helpful to use a number of different transducers depending on the patient's body habitus and what access points, um, what windows you're going to use. So if we talk about normal renal vasculature, the renal arteries arise from the aorta anterolaterally, usually about one to two centimeters inferior to the superior mesenteric artery, and the right renal artery passes posterior to the inferior vena cava. It's a little longer than the left renal artery. The right renal vein is very short and has a short course from the renal hilum to the IVC or inferior vena cava. The left renal artery is much longer than the right and it passes between the SMA and the aorta. And the renal uh, vein ex exits anteriorly at the hilum, posteriorly, and the artery is between the two. Um, accessory renal arteries are usually inferior to the main re renal artery, but they actually can uh, come off of one of the poles of the kidney and go back to the aorta at almost any point. So it's, uh, we'll talk about ways to look for those. The landmarks that you're going to use are those that are displayed here. You're going to use the left renal vein, the superior mesenteric artery, and again the liver and the spleen to help identify. And here you see a fair amount of portion of the right renal artery displayed just below where the SMA comes off. The renal artery divides into four or five interlobar segments. The interlobar arteries arch over the pyramids and they uh, come to form the arcuate arteries which give rise to the interlobar arteries. Those further divide into the afferent arterioles that go into the glomerulus that does the work of the kidney, all of the filtering. And then when that is done, blood leaves the glomerulus through the afferent arterioles. Now I said that multiple renal arteries are present in about 25% of patients and that does present a challenge for us. So you can check the symmetry throughout the entire kidney. If uh, you're in transverse and uh, normally the right renal artery comes off at about 10 or 11 o'clock and the left renal artery comes off at about 4 o'clock, 
If you see renal arteries that come off at a different location than this, then be suspicious for duplicated uh, renal arteries because usually that's the presentation. Um, when you do find multiple renal arteries, you need to assess them in their entirety. Um, and and uh, there, there is always the chance that you're going to miss one of them if there are multiple renal arteries. Another tip in finding them is to evaluate uh, the hyalur regions and um, poles of the kidney and look for vessels that are coming off there and track all the way back to the aorta. There are a number of anatomic variants that may occur that you'll encounter in doing a renovascular study. Horseshoe kidney is fairly rare, less than 1% of the time. 90% of those are fused at the lower pole and anterior to the aorta, uh, generally at the fourth to fifth vertebrae. Early branching will occur outside the hilum of the kidney about 15% of time, so don't think that that's a duplicated artery. It's just that there is an early branching um, before the hilum. Retroaortic left renal vein is present about 3% of the time, and a circumaortic left renal vein about 9% of the time. So let's talk about the protocol. We're going to use a sub-xiphoid approach generally to begin, looking for the areas uh, of any aortic disease. Um, we're going to look in the suprarenal, uh, juxtarenal, and infrarenal segments of the aorta and sample the aortic velocity about the level of the SMA, and that's the one we're going to use for the RAR, or renal to uh, aortic ratio. We do not use the RAR when aortic velocities are less than 40 or greater than 100 centimeters, or if there's significant atherosclerotic disease within the aorta or aneurysmal disease, because that's going to affect the velocity. Normal velocity um, waveforms morphology in the suprarenal aorta has more diastolic flow, and the reason for that is that it is feeding a lower resistant vascular bed. The celiac will come off there and feed the liver and the spleen, both of which are low resistant vascular beds, and the renal arteries, of course, are feeding the kidneys. Once you get past the renal arteries, the infrarenal aorta is a much higher resistant signal, as you can see, uh, and that's because it's only feeding high resistant peripheral arterial um, flow. When we're doing the proximal aortic velocity, we kind of need to walk through the renal artery, proximal, mid, and distal, and we're going to need to walk into the origin of the renal artery uh, from the aorta. So you'll start with that low res lower resistant uh, signal in the aorta to make sure you don't miss any orificial stenoses. We'll document samples in the aorta at the osteum of the renal artery, proximal, mid, and distal in the renal artery, always at less than 60 degrees, angle of incidence and excluding any stenotic disease that it can occur up along any segment of that main renal artery. And then if there are segmental branches, particularly if they are um, easily assessed outside the uh, hilum of the kidney, you'll check some of those segmental branches, particularly if you have any reason to suspect that there may be a stenosis there. Once we have completed assessment of the entire renal artery, we're going to go to the parenchyma and we're going to look at the parenchymal signals in at least the upper and distal poles of the kidney. They should be symmetrical. They should be symmetrical in the waveform morphology as well as symmetrical in about the um, uh, velocity and systolic rise time and, and acceleration time. Um, we're going to do renal per, uh, parenchymal resistive index indices and uh, real-time spectral Doppler. Document the patency of the renal vein somewhere along the course of the renal vein. Measure kidney pole to pole length and then document any incidental findings found along the course of the study such as cysts, mass, hydronephrosis, hydroureter, or stones. Use B-mode color, color power angio, harmonic imaging, any of the tools that you have uh, with your equipment to identify uh, the flow. If you're going to use color power, you're not going to be able to identify direction of flow, but certainly you'll be able to tell that it's a well-perfused kidney, identify the branches, and then you can change into regular color to identify the art arteries that you need to assess. The color and B mode settings need to be adjusted for proper sensitivity. You'll need different sensitivity settings um, when looking at the main renal artery, and then of course lower sensitivity settings when you get out into the small vessels in the parenchyma. You'll want to adjust the size and angle of your color box, adjust the wall filters. They will need to be low when you get out of the parenchyma. The gains should be a little bit higher. PRF should be lower, and you can actually increase the color persistence on your machine to allow the color to hang around just a little bit longer so that you can place your 
uh, Doppler within these small vessels within the parenchyma of the kidney. And that's particularly helpful when there's a low flow state going on in the kidney. Um, use color power Doppler sometimes, adjust the Doppler sweep speed to um, a very fast sweep speed, and that'll give you a larger waveform to measure your systolic rise time or acceleration time. Um, just a bit of a tip, some of the, my favorite um, ways of accessing the renal artery, if you have the patient turn onto their left side um, and then take the transducer and angle that against the rib cage so that you're almost in an oblique position um, paralleling the rib cage and then angle up. That will give you usually the view that you see below this uh, demonstration which is um, the aorta in transverse and unless there's some sort of tortuosity in the renal artery you can follow the renal artery all the way out to the hilum of the kidney and get all of that in one plane of view. If you can't get it all in one plane of view, at least get it into larger segments instead of small pieces of the renal artery. That'll give you better assessment of the entire renal artery. On the left, you can go subcostal um, under the rib cage and angle up. Of course, the left renal artery is much shorter, so it's easier to lay the entire left renal artery out in one plane of view. Another technical tip is don't be afraid to push. Patients usually are fine with you pushing on their abdomen. Here's an example of the transducer basically just lying on the surface of the skin and you can barely see the left renal artery there and with a slight push in, um, the renal artery is much more visible uh, and available for assessment. So don't be afraid to push. Other technical considerations, um, obviously appropriate angles is crucial and we need to be 60 degrees or less corrected very um, to be parallel to the vessel walls. This is very important. Uh, we know that the smaller the angle, the lower the estimate of velocity, but if it's not parallel to flow, then the math calculation that is going to be done by the equipment for you is going to be completely off. And you can see here where there's not good angle correction to parallel the flow in the image to the left, you're calculating an erroneous uh, velocity calculation of 191 centimeters per second. When that angle is corrected to the correct angle of incidence parallel to the flow at 22 degrees within that um, vessel, you have a much different um, velocity, but it is more correct. Frequently, the renal arteries can be angulated. You want to be careful not to give the patient disease when it's in fact just tortuous. So be careful not to overestimate disease in tortuous vessels. One of the clues is that if you don't have postenotic turbulence after you find a focal increase in velocity, you probably don't have a stenosis. It may be due simply to tortuosity. Normal renal Doppler velocity waveforms have a very low resistant flow characteristic with forward flow throughout diastole. Should have a rapid systolic upstroke. There may be an early compliance peak that can be higher or lower than the actual systolic peak. We should see rapid deceleration um, to that constant forward diastolic flow. And the renal vein flow is normal, normally phasic. When we do see renal artery stenosis, there are some clinical features that are associated with functionally significant renal artery stenosis of greater than 60 degrees, and that may include smaller kidneys, a discrepancy in a kidney size greater than one and a half centimeters, as long as it's not congenital, is usually consistent with renal artery stenosis in the smaller, uh, supplying the smaller kidney. Certainly we'll begin to see hypertension and some patients may present with flash pulmonary edema or unexplained recurrent CHF or congestive heart failure. We need to rely on multiple parameters for the diagnosis of renal artery stenosis. Um, as long as the uh, renal artery artery uh, ratio um, can be used, the renal to aortic ratio can be used. That is a good uh, ratio that takes out some of the velocity variations. Um, we're going to look for increased peak systolic velocity greater than 180 or 200 centimeters per second. We're going to be looking to document that post turbulence to be sure we have a stenosis present, and that should be within a centimeter or so distal to the stenosis. The pole-to-pole -pole kidney length should be symmetrical. Acceleration time or systolic rise time can be measured as an adjunct um, additional piece of information to confirm stenosis. And of course, look at your B mode. Look at uh, the echogenicity of the kidney as well. Um, we're looking uh, now uh, talking about parenchymal artery flow. Let's talk just a little bit about 
resistive end disease. Resistive end disease really have nothing to do with renal artery stenosis, so why do we talk about it? Well, resistive end disease, when they're elevated, are uh, an indication of medical renal disease within the kidney that has nothing to do with renal artery uh, flow, but it has to do with medical renal disease within the parenchyma of the kidney. But this can uh, affect some of our other measurements, so we need to know when it's present. Um, we calculate the renal re um, artery resistive index, which measures in diastolic to peak systolic ratio, and it's usually ab considered abnormal when it's over 0.65 to 0 0.70. How is this measured? Um, the peak uh, systolic velocity then is um, you subtract the end diastolic from the peak and then divide that by the peak, and that's how it, resistive index is calculated. Um, most people use resistive index to calculate the resistivity within the kidney. There is also another method of calculating resistivity within the kidney, um, and that's called the diastolic to systolic ratio. It's measuring basically the same thing, how the resistance in the kidney um, it is, but it's just measured with the diastolic velocity divided by the peak systolic velocity. When you use this measurement instead of the resistive index, you're looking for a measurement uh, to be normal of less than 0.2. So here are examples of a normal resistive index, and you see the normal amount of diastolic flow within that kidney, and this is a resi resistive index in the normal range of 0.53. As you lose more of the diastolic flow, you see um, to the right, it, the picture is um, abnormal with a very high resistive index of 0.86. Let's talk about echogenicity of the kidney. In normally, the renal cortex is homogeneous and slightly less echogenic than the liver. We have good corticomedullary definition then between uh, the cortex and the, and the uh, medulla. When this medical renal disease increases for whatever reason, there's a diffuse increase in the echogenic echogenicity of the cortex, and it may be more difficult to separate the corticomedullary definition. So here's an example where there's normal uh, RI and no significant uh, increased resistivity in the kidney and you see good normal uh, echogenicity within the kidney and the cortex is usually a little less echogenic than the adjacent liver. The picture on the right you can see that it is much more echogenic and much more difficult to separate where the cortex and the medulla may be. In a patient uh, with a poorly functioning or non-functioning kidney, that kidney becomes very echogenic and as you can see more echogenic than the adjacent liver. Now, I said we were going to talk about some of the indirect testing that can be adjunctive to the evaluation of the main renal artery. Systolic rise time, or also called acceleration time, um, is the interval from the onset of systole in one cardiac cycle to the initial peak. And it's normally less than 100 uh, milliseconds. It actually is normally less than about 60 milliseconds, and over 100 milliseconds is usually consistent with significant stenosis or occlusion. These are very small waveforms and um, very subject to um, error, so you really need to speed the sweep speed up to elongate the waveforms and decrease the scale to enlarge the waveforms so that you have a larger field to do this very small measurement with. Now there is one caveat. If the patient has a significantly elevated RI, this will affect the accuracy of the systolic rise time or acceleration time measurements. And you may not get a delay when you ordinarily would because the kidney's just too stiff uh, with the RI being elevated to produce the normal systolic rise time delay. So you would not want to use that in a patient who has um, markedly elevated resistive index. Normal um, systolic rise time or acceleration time as you see here of 60 milliseconds is measured from, in, uh, not in diastole, but beginning systole to that first compliance peak. And you can see how that's measured. When that is quite delayed, it's sometimes called tardis and parvus, where it is a very delayed rise to peak. So again, concomitant medical renal disease will influence these calculations. The systolic rise time cannot differentiate stenosis from occlusion, so that's a limitation of that measurement. It can't localize where the lesion is, as can direct assessment of the renal artery. And it doesn't give you any velocity information for serial follow-up. 
in the presence of multiple renal arteries, it may not be as helpful. And if you don't have a really good uh, waveform, if you don't pick up a good center stream, um, inner lobar arcuate or intralobar vessel, uh, you may miss the first compliance peak and not do a correct measurement. So those are all limitations. Now, talking about that compliance peak, they're sometimes difficult to see. So here is where this uh, was actually measured, um, which is uh, the, the true peak, not the first compliance peak. Here is a better waveform to measure, and here is where that first compliance peak is. So you will want to measure from um, beginning systole to that first compliance peak, not the actual systolic peak. So we'll talk briefly now about what happens after some kind of intervention to renal artery for, for the presence of renal artery stenosis. That can be surgical revascularization with either a bypass graft or an endarterectomy of the renal artery, or more often today, we see percutaneous angioplasty with or without a stent present. Careful documentation of follow-up studies um, so that we can find out if there is residual versus recurrent stenoses. Changes in the aortic condition or the velocities can um, affect this. Renal artery velocity should be taken from at least two views when following up after uh, any revascularization. And sometimes it's really hard to get a good angle because vessel angulation will change after a stent has been placed in there and it may be harder to get an under 60 degree angle. There's a lot of research going on right now to determine what is um, a, du a correct duplex uh, velocity following PTA and stent, particularly in stents when there's a decreased compliance of the vessel. We need to walk the entire stent, uh, through the entire stent with spectral Doppler. You can have a stenosis occur anywhere within the, the uh, course of the stent. The distal stent is the most common site of restenosis, but again, you can have it anywhere along the course of the stent, so we need to look at the entire uh, stented portion. Rigid stent structures can cause elevated velocities without any restenosis, so what you're looking for is any focal increase within the stent, not necessarily just pan stent um, increase uh, velocities that might be caused due to loss of compliance. Frequently, stents are placed within the renal artery and extrude into the aorta. The picture to the left, you can see in the aorta, the aortic, um, the renal artery stent that is extending out into that. And the reason for that is as many of these plaques can ex extend into the orifice and out into the wall of the aorta um, from the renal artery. And so they want to make sure that the stent covers all of the disease that's present. So here in the longitudinal view in the middle picture, you can see a stent again that extrudes out into the um, aortic lumen. The picture to the right is showing you that there's been a, because that stent is present, there's been a change in the angle of the right renal artery. And instead of arching up, where, which is a more optimum uh, angle for incidence for going through the uh, origin of the aorta. This one is not at 60 degrees and not accessible, ex at least in this particular view, at 60 degrees. So you'll have to try a different view to walk the Doppler through the uh, stented portion in that um, part of the right renal artery. If you do encounter stenosis, we should have post-stenotic turbulence present. Otherwise, again, it may just be increased velocity due to loss of compliance. The angle of the vessel, as you can see in this uh, picture, has changed due to stent placement, and close monitoring has to be done to um, make sure that you, in fact, um, have a, st a stenosis present within any of these stents. If renal artery bypass graft or endarterectomy has been done, the anastomotic areas are the most frequent site of any recurrent stenosis. And the protocol for the exam would be pretty much the same as native renal arteries with special attention paid to those anastomotic sites. Incidental findings that might be um, seen along the course of doing a renal artery duplex include renal cysts, hydronephrosis, stones, masses, aneurysms, and developmental renal artery stenosis. Simple cysts should just be measured and noted as an incidental finding. Um, Polycystic kidneys can just be noted to be there. If you run into hydronephrosis or hydroureter, that should be mentioned as an incidental finding in your report. 
Fibromuscular dysplasia is, uh, usually occurs in the mid to distal renal artery. It's typically found in middle-aged females and is described um, angiographically as a string of beads appearance, usually these sequential stenoses. The parenchymal signals, interestingly enough, are usually not affected by uh, FMD, and the velocities that are obtained are usually a little lower than similar amounts of stenoses with atherosclerotic disease. If you encounter renal artery aneurysms, these should be measured and noted where they occur along the course of the renal artery. The exact incidence of uh, renal artery aneurysms is not well known. There are four types, macro aneurysms, dissecting renal artery aneurysms, those that are associated with FMD, and those that are associated with arteritis. The etiology of them can be FMD, atherosclerotic, arteritis, trauma, and complications of a uh, procedure. Most renal artery aneurysms are asymptomatic and rupture is rare uh, within the renal artery aneurysms. They can result in, in embolization or renovascular hypertension. Spontaneous dissections most often occur in otherwise normal arteries. The pathogenesis of this is poorly understood, usually occurs in the mid portion of the renal artery, and intervention is usually indicated um, if there's an acute occluding dissection or severe renal uh, vascular hypertension associated with it. Um, the subgroups of these can be spontaneous, non-iatrogenic trauma. It may be catheter-based. It can be associated with ischemia is far more common in men, and about a third of them are bilateral. Renal arterial venous fistula malformations. Um, this uh, renal artery, ar arterial venous fistula, is an abnormal uh, arterial and venous connection at the capillary level or a direct connection between a main artery and vein. Um, acquired lesions after biopsy are much more common than congenital lesions, and uh, again, biopsy and sometimes penetrating trauma are the main causes of renal AVFs. They usually present with an increased cardiac output and venous return, resulting in hypertension, perhaps hematuria. Um, abdominal brewery is present in about 70% of these patients. Developmental stenosis is uncommon, but it causes about 40% of renovascular hypertension in children so it's worth mentioning. Hyperplastic vessels occur with secondary enamel fibroplasia, and they usually have an abnormal fusion of the paired dorsal aorta. So in conclusion, renal artery duplex is an accurate and safe exam for the diagnosis of significant renal artery stenosis. It can be very valuable following a procedure, and it can be valuable in following the progression of disease prior to treatment. The accuracy is directly proportional to the experience of the examiner, um, and it takes careful preparation and time um, to perform uh, these studies. Thank you.